Hey, it's Mateo of Two Brain Marketing. On this edition of the Two Brain Marketing Podcast, I'm talking with senior Two Brain mentor, Jeff Burlingame, owner of Friction CrossFit in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This episode is all about sales, the final piece in your marketing funnel. Jeff has been selling personal training and fitness since he was 18 years old and is now the sales guru at Two Brain Business. So you don't wanna miss this. Make sure to subscribe to Two Brain Radio for more marketing tips and secrets each week. Hello, welcome to the Two Brain Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Mateo Lopez. I'm one of the digital marketing mentors at Two Brain Business. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is your weekly dose of digital marketing magic. In today's episode, we have a really, 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 really special guest. Uh, we've got Jeff Burlingame in my phone. He is labeled as Jeff B. Games, and uh, he is one of the senior mentors at Two Brain Business. He's been around the block, and he uh, he talks to probably he's probably talked to more gym owners than I have. And we're going to learn a little bit about him, his experience, and specifically, we're going to talk about sales. Sales is a really key component to your marketing funnel. Uh, if you, you can have really cheap leads and have a lot of people inquiring about your service, but if you can't close them, it's all for naught. Isn't that right, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's all for naught. Mm. <laughs> so what's the point of giving... Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, all your your doll hairs, if you uh, they're just gonna go go nowhere. So that's why I wanted to bring on Jeff today, and he uh, he cleared some time out of his very busy schedule to talk to me. So I'm very grateful. Jeff, how's it going? It's going great, bud. I'm excited to be here. Excited to, to play along. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Jeff is a uh, father of two. He lives in. Uh, Michigan, and he enjoys fishing. <laughs> so, Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what's your business. I mean, you said it all, man. You said it all. Yeah, so like you said, I'm from Michigan, Grand Rapids specifically. I own Friction CrossFit. That gym has been open for a little over five years now. We just passed five-year mark in June. Where'd the name Friction CrossFit come from? I uh, literally flipped pages in an encyclopedia and just found that I don't know like I feel like that was the experience of a lot of people at the time that I, I set up my gym because CrossFit had did not started denying the area codes and the city names so there was already like a CrossFit Grand Rapids and there was a 616 in my area and then like I couldn't do anything else anyways so uh, me and a couple guys that were starting out as coaches for me we just like started throwing names on the board and I submitted, I'm pretty sure 50 names before I got that one approved. Wow. <laughs> there was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of really weird names that could have been, but I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm happy with what. No, it's a really cool name. That's why I was, that's why I was asking. I, I like the name. Friction, you know, creates energy, but also you'll run up against friction in your life. And if you can overcome it through strength, speed, and power, agility, accuracy, uh, you'll win. Deep of a meaning. <laughs> I wish that much thought process went into it. It's literally like, oh, this looks like a good word. Let's throw that at him. I was so done with the process at that point, too. I was like, look, pick one of these 10 words for us, and we're in. <laughs> like, but so yeah, it, it could be a lot. It could mean a lot. How did you get into CrossFit? Well, first, tell me, tell me a little bit about your experience with fitness. Yeah, how did it start? And then how did you find CrossFit? Tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, I've been big into fitness since the seventh grade. And that was about the time that I was sick of being a chubby kid because I was a chubby kid, like late elementary school to sixth grade. I was like, what do I do? And I talked to like some football coaches. and They're like, dude, just work out. So I worked out in this, like the original high school gym we had at our high school. I went from my middle school, had my mom drop me off to go work out at high school. And it was just this like dingy little, like there, there was like a, a heater just like out in the open for the entire school there. So it was like a really hot room uh, behind our auxiliary gym and just like tried to 
to work out with, uh, you know, freshmen through seniors of high school. And I'm a seventh grader. So it was really a nerve wracking situation, but um, I grew to love just lifting weights and I've been doing that obviously ever since. But yeah, it was like, dude, just worked out. That was the answer. Dude, just work out. Just work out. That was literally the answer from my middle school football (laughs) coach. So thanks to props to him. But yeah, so like that was the beginning of it. I I took classes in high school and then um, there were some local gyms I joined after high school and got like really big into it. So like around the time I was 18, I started, I got my first certification to be a personal trainer. Um, started doing training from there. I trained through college. I went to Michigan State University and trained on campus. And then I got a job off campus and that was my first uh, sales job. Um, I had two sales jobs at the same time. I was working at Dick's Sporting Goods as well uh, in the fitness department. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. I was a bike tech and I also worked in the fitness department, but I sold extended warranties on treadmills that were guaranteed to break in a year. So Chris Cooper and I have that in common if you read his books, uh, but it was a pretty awful sales gig, but I got really good at it. I sold a lot of those things. And my other sales job was selling personal training. Uh, which is brand new to me, uh, getting into the service industry, totally different from selling product warranties. That took a minute to get used to. I started reading a lot of books on sales and just sort of like implementing the things that I was reading right away and seeing a a lot of growth as far as my sales ability from that. I started setting like company records. That was a a subcontracting personal training company I worked with. So we basically supplied the PT and gave a cut to uh, Globo Gyms. Um, but you know, we were not like hired by them. We had to manage ourselves completely separately. So it's a very interesting situation selling thousands of dollars worth of PT to people that are spending $20 a month on a membership. So it was a really good experience for me in terms of like growing in sales. Wow. That is, that's insane. So you were like a personal, it was a personal training company, but that wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with the gym really. And they sub they subcontracted all that work out to you guys. You gave a, a cut to them for I guess just supplying the bodies. That's wild. Huge for a little while. Like we were nationwide. There's like 48 gyms that we were in at the time, and you know none of my bosses lived anywhere near me. We just would hop on conference calls with like 40 other uh, sales managers and just like role play and do stuff like that. It's a pretty crazy experience. What were some of the books you were reading? I want to, what's the, what's the recommended reading list? I know some of them because I heard it in the incubator and I was like, oh, Brian Tracy. Oh, eat that frog. What are your, what are the go-to books for those listening who want to up their sales game? So, I mean, you'll, you'll always hear like how to win friends and influence people. That was the first book. So the, the company I worked for was big on a book of the month. So I read a lot of books through them. How to Win Friends and Influence People is, is a great start. But if you want to specifically get really good at sales, I went off and did my own reading beyond what they were recommending. You mentioned, you know, how Eat That Frog, Brian Tracy is huge because we did a lot of cold calling and I had to like approach people who were on a treadmill in the middle of the workout, headphones in, you know, in a, def- a different land at, the, at that moment. And I had to like say, hey, excuse me. And like, I-, I would mimic taking my headphone out so they would take their headphone out. And they always did. It was amazing. And I'd have to ask them to book a, what we had two brain called a no sweat intro, what we called at that time, a personal training experience or a PTX. So I'd have to book this PTX with them and they had no idea this was coming. They're spending 20 bucks a month. They're like, I'm in the gym. Like I did the thing. I already signed up. So it was really nerve wracking and tough for me to do that uh, as well as like pick up the phone and just dial numbers. So eat that frog helped me just like organize my day and keep in mind, like, you know, just pick up the phone start pressing numbers and like, this will happen. It's like, just get it done. So I think that was one of my, probably the, one that led me to the most productive moments. But as far as like sales systems and improving our sales system, Jeffrey Gittimer's The Sales Bible was like a very good starting point as well as the Little Red Book of Selling, which he also wrote. And then the other one that's probably one of my favorite books was The Psychology of Selling by Brian Tracy, getting more into understanding buying signals, body language, you know, the, the buyer's mentality and psychology and as as well as like starting to get into empathy and understanding and interpreting emotions. But currently more, those are older books. 
more of a, a modern approach to it that I really like is uh, one I started reading recently, which is Sales EQ by Jeb Blount. Um, but that, that really is 100% focused on empathy, you know, understanding, interpreting those emotions, like how to respond to it and how to, without, you know, like, you know, tricking somebody into the sale, how to lead a buyer to the, the buying decision. So there's lots of good books out there. Those are my, probably my favorites. Yeah, I, I did the uh, psychology of selling uh, after you recommended it. It's awesome. I did uh, eat that frog, which is good too. And yeah, it's it's interesting you're saying this because it's like, wow, it, it it must have been refreshing when you finally got to your gym and like people were like walking in interested in your service. <laughs> you know, it must have been a, a different dynamic. Like, oh wow, they're actually at least open to the idea of talking to me. I don't have to like interrupt their workout to, to beg them to like sit down and talk to me. It's, it's quite a bit different. And that's the, the funny thing is like, that was 10 years of my fitness experience was just selling training to people like on campus, like students that obviously can't afford it, that were getting a free membership to go and sell them. I mean, we were pretty cheap. It was like 20 bucks a session, more of almost a slightly paid internship at the time, but still tough to, you know, they pay 20 bucks a month at these, uh, like locally owned global gyms, not even like franchises. And, you know, we're, we're selling, uh, like a twice a week training package was like $3,300 and it's, you know, selling that is a huge upsell to, uh, I, I moved to Virginia with my wife in 2010. Uh, shortly after graduating at uh, MSU and we were working at like multi-million dollar gyms. There's this huge franchise. They always had just really big gyms, um, really, you know, 15 to 18,000 members, all of which were paying like closer to like 40, 50 bucks, uh, which is appropriate for that area. Like the, the DMV area is where we were living uh, near DC. So it's really expensive, but yeah, like 50 bucks a month. And we're, we were selling, you know, packages of sessions that at that point, um, I don't like selling that way anymore, but like, you know, our common pack was like 48 sessions or 80 sessions paid in full. So we're, we're selling like these big cash deals to those people. So yeah, it was like most of my sales experience was in those types of situations to, to go to, you know, opening a CrossFit gym and yeah, people are like ready to spend 150 bucks a month easy. And then, Selling the PT is a lot easier than it was in the past, for sure. So how did you get into CrossFit then? I got into CrossFit when I was in Virginia. The funny thing about it that I always told my coaches when we got started in the gym was I used to make fun of CrossFit. So it was like one of those trainers that uh, there were, there was a period of time where trainers, and I wasn't the only one, but trainers would use CrossFit to sell personal training in that they would say like, look, you know, you can go out and you can do these group training things like uh, Les Mills was getting big at the time too. You, know, you go do that, you go do CrossFit, like you're guaranteed to get hurt. Like it's going to happen. If you do personal training with us, like you're not going to get hurt. And it was actually a selling point for me for like years. And then finally, there was just a bunch of trainers. Every I, I oversaw uh, seven gyms on the East Coast when I was over there. And uh, I used to like fly back and forth to New York as well. But between Virginia and New York, we had seven gyms. Every gym I was at, we had upwards of 40 trainers. And being around that many people in the fitness industry and like, you know, you had bodybuilders, you guys like juice heads, basically a lot of those in, in Virginia, had those guys. And then we had uh, CrossFitters, we had long distance runners, we had triathletes, like there's just all sorts of just diverse backgrounds in fitness, which was really cool to be around and experience what they were doing for their training. Because, you know, you work in a CrossFit gym, it's lunchtime, everybody goes and does CrossFit or they jump into a class. But when you're at like a global gym like that, I would see, you know, this kid doing some sort of a triathlete workout, this kid doing, uh, you know, we had crazy equipment at the time. One of them was called like the power plate. And we would train, we had like some celebrities that would come in in Virginia. What was it David Batista used to go to one of my gyms in Fairfax, Virginia. And train one of my trainers so i would see him coming in and he and his manager would come in and train on the power plate for example so it's just this big fat platform that vibrates at a high frequency and there is there's theoretical things going on but i i don't know so that was happening but you see people do that and it would have like big cages pull-up cages uh the the multi-use ones where like 
on this corner there's a rope that you can climb on this corner there's a medicine ball toss right closer to like a wall ball but it had like a trampoline right so it bounces back at you but you start getting into things that are getting closer to what crossfit is and then some of the trainers i was around they, they would talk about crossfit and then they'd go and they'd start doing crossfit workouts and i was like what the heck is that and i was like oh yeah it's this thing i've been making fun of this whole time uh and i was like you know what like i'll do a workout with them so I would like jump in and do workouts of different types with these guys. And I, I jumped in, I did a crossfit workout. I was like, that was the worst thing that I've ever had to do compared to like no comparison to anything else I've had to do. So I, I liked it naturally. And I was like, let's do more of this. Um, I used to wrestle in high school. So for me, a workout that just absolutely destroys you is like what I look for. I was really sick of uh, you know bodybuilding type stuff. I was like, I'm, just, oh, I'm done with this. It's too boring. Let's do something else. Um, so I started doing that. I think my first workout was Fran, and it took me ten minutes. It took me forever. I used the like the uh, flat edged plates, like the octagonal plates that you see at gyms. I had those in the tw- the twenty fives on the bar, so it was like lower than your normal height. And I had to do my pull-ups strict on uh, those like multi-grip pull-up cages. So I was like the weird angles and stuff trying to do my pull-ups. It was a mess. I was flopping around like fish, took me 10 minutes and I almost passed out. So yeah, I've come a a decent distance since then with my fitness level. So then you were hooked and then I guess you then opened your own gym. What was life life like back then in the early days pre-2Brain? From there, you know, I I was in Virginia for almost four years. I came back to Michigan, which is where I'm from and where I grew up in late 2013, early 2014, I think it was. It might have been like December 2013. But um, basically what I decided was I was sick of this corporate world, running seven gyms, hundreds of trainers under me was just exhausting. I was pulling 14-hour days, five days a week, and like every month was like hitting the reset button. My bosses didn't care what happened the month before. There was no appreciation. I was just, I was done with it. So I talked to a buddy of mine in Michigan and I I started looking at CrossFit. I was like, dude, I could open a CrossFit gym. I have no money. Uh, And apparently you can do that. You can open a CrossFit gym with no money. So I was like, I think I can do this. I think I'd be good at it. So I decided to move back to Michigan and do that. I ended up having to work for another company full time while trying to get this thing up and running because I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's dealt with that uh, financially. So that was kind of floating things for me uh, for a little while. I even like lived with my in-laws for six months. <laughs> so that was fun. So I had support, but, you know, pre two brain, like I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I was trying to follow the lead of others in the industry that I thought were doing the right thing and weren't. Um, and that kind of led me astray. So what happened was about... Six months into finally opening this thing is uh, we were homeless. We got booted from our first space uh, by my partner who then broke our partnership. And he later on was a part of like getting me fired. Within the next six months, I got fired from the full-time job, the gyms I was working at. Um, He was a part of that as well as uh, another guy that I had partnered up with to open a second gym when I absolutely should not have. Nowhere near ready for this. So all of this like happened pre two brain. Like it's basically like I, I did all this stuff and was just failing really hard, essentially borderline bankrupt. I can't even pay my coaches. And then I decided something had to change. So I just like hopped on the affiliate owners uh, forums, tried to find out like what the heck you do when you don't know what you're doing. Uh, I came across people talking real good about Chris's book, got Chris's book. And I saw within the first couple of pages that he was uh, mentoring. So I was like, I don't like reading books anyway, so I just put it down and I just called him up. <laughs> I was like, hey man, take me on, let's do this. But yeah, then, you know, from there, that was 2016 at that point. It was January 2016 that I started with Two Brain. And like that full year was just a year of like revelations, just everything started coming together. Following year, after it had been like kind of, we, we set things up in the right way, we built a, a good, strong foundation. The following year, 2017, we did 250% of our revenue versus 2016. Um, And then the following year after that, I essentially fired myself from the business and I haven't been back 16 months now. I think it's been 16 or 17 months. Well, I have a lot of questions about that. But my first one is though, what what advice do you have for people who are 
thinking about opening a gym, maybe don't have as much of the financial means, similar to what you were, your situation, and are thinking about taking on a partner, what's your advice there for choosing the right one? Or is your advice, wait and just don't ever choose one? Yeah, my due to personal experience, I'm a no partner kind of person. I don't know specifically if it if it's just me. Like I don't do well with partners, but yeah, I I, I would say typically what you're going to run into, and gosh, I know this comes up in books. I know Chris has talked about this too. Is like if you're going to have a partner, they have to be the opposite of you. Like uh, the people I was getting partnered up with um, either didn't care at all or were basically the same as me. And, you know, when they were purely abdicators and didn't care, like they were setting everything up for failure and I had to get out of there before they like brought me down with them. That was the second location that uh, we opened this. <laughs> it started quickly going downhill. Luckily, he eventually sold that, got out of the situation. You know, I'm happy for him, but we just were not good partners. And then the other one was... Uh, he, he got in it for all the wrong reasons and then realized like his reasons were wrong and then wanted to just bail out as quick as possible. And that's where he tried to, to basically burn me to, to get out of that one. So that, that sucked. But I would say if they're the absolute opposite of you in that, you know, let's say you love coaching, they can't also love coaching. You're going to be terrible partners because you're both just, you're going to want to coach. If they love doing like uh, the back end stuff, that, that's kind of me. I liked the systems and developing that and putting things together and, you know, dealing with communications and sales and, you know, getting people in the gym. I didn't like coaching as much. Um, so I needed a partner that was closer to that. Right. Um, but I never had that. Like everybody I was partnered with wanted to be on the back end, like either be invisible or just like make everybody else around them do all the other things. <laughs> so it's just never a good fit that way. So if you're going to have one, if they're the absolute opposite of you, awesome. If not, do not partner up just for money. There's other ways. There are so many ways to get money. You can find another way. I've gotten SBA loans. I've used car loans to get uh, money for the gym. Bank loans are, are tougher, but not impossible for gyms. Um, and then there's always like third party resources or you can even have somebody just uh, invest in you, but stay like silent or, you know, take very low equity. If they have to take something, there's, there's opportunities there too. So, yeah. Awesome. So for people who are curious and are hoping to one day fire themselves from their gym, and when we, when we say fire, your, uh, fire yourself, we just mean rem remove yourself from the day-to-day -day operations or maybe just be in the CEO role more where you're not doing all the hats. What's the first step to getting to that point where you're like yourself and you're sitting in the office in your house all day and playing with your daughters and fishing? What's the first step? Yeah, I mean, the first step is, is and I've been working with uh, some other clients that you ran on this too um, over the years, but you know, the first step is identifying basically all the things that you do or should do, uh, and then trying to figure out which of those things that you do only you can do uh, which of those things can be automated, right? In other words, nobody needs to do. Uh, and then which of those things remaining are like necessary or unnecessary. So like it all starts with a list. And, and the first thing I had to do is just come up with that list because even if you have the, even if you have the right people that you feel are the right people, you don't know what you need them to do. So you could say like, you're going to take over from me. I, I don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to basically be me. And that's confusing for them. And that's not very motivational. So I did that my first time. So actually I tried to pull out of my gym in 2017 and got completely burned. You know, I just did it all the wrong way. I didn't, I didn't go about it the way I should have. And I put the wrong person in charge. And then after that blew up, he and another coach like tried to bring us down. We basically, and I had a member try to bring us down too. So we lost 40 members over the course of two months. Um, and I almost just completely buried the gym, uh, but we were able to pull out of that, give me another six months after that. And that's when, you know, I went about it the right way, had the right people in place, knew what they had to do and we were able to, to do it the right way. Obviously I'm, I'm not there still. So, but yeah, if you start with that list, if you know what needs to be done, 
Um, you know, you cut off the unnecessary, you automate what can be automated. You know, the things that only you can do, you're going to have to hold those till the end, but whatever's left that's necessary, it's like, okay, this is my list of things. Um, and you can create roles out of that. So you, then you just like go to your, uh, your hierarchy for the business. So this is your org chart. What are the roles? What do each of those roles need to uh, be doing? And then let's start the people hunt, right? So who do I need to fulfill these roles? What type of characteristics am I looking for? Uh, and then we can move to people. Um, I did a talk on this at the summit. So once we have who we think are the right people, it's all about just building them really slowly. Um, so I took, I mean, honestly, I took like four years to develop my CEO, but you know, once we actually committed to the thing, it was about six months, but it's just like, all right, you know, sort of uh, applying tasks to them, let's see how you do. And then we would uh, objectively evaluate them at the end of the month. We would also subjectively evaluate them. So it's like, how did you perform? And then how do you feel? Um, and once I got a feel for like, okay, he likes doing these things. He's good at these things. This is his role. He's bad at these things or he doesn't like doing these things. That's not going to be his role. So we move that to somebody else. So there's a lot of like testing, retesting and shuffling pieces until we figured out like, okay, you're this role, you're this role. And now everything that I had on my plate was covered. So then I knew I can step away. And at that point I took 30 days off, no communication. And that was like the initial test. So it was like, all right, guys, I'm out as of today. You have the entire month on your own. Um, if you need anything, you know, it should be in our systems and only in an emergency do you reach out to me. So did the 30 days, came back. Do you guys need me? They said, no. I was like, cool. And then I just didn't come back after that. That's awesome. Uh, I want to move on now. If anyone wants to learn more about that process with Jeff, you can book a free help call and talk to him about that. <laughs> He'll give you the more, more details on that. That's just a sneak peek on how to level up out of your gym and fire yourself. But uh, I want to circle back now. We started this conversation with sales. I want to end it there. Last five, 10 minutes here. So what is your approach to sales at Friction CrossFit? So a lead comes in. Their appointment's booked. They walk up to your front door. What happens? Yeah, so um, you know, we, we follow essentially the process that we lay out in Two Brain Marketing um, to get them in the door first and foremost. But once they're in the door, then that's the actual uh, no sweat intro process that we go through. That's all laid out uh, in the books and the materials that we've shared in the past. Obviously, anybody in Two Brain is going to get that too. But really, what it what it boils down to is problem solving. Right? That's all sales is is problem solving. There is no scenario where sales have to be like trickery. Um, we don't use any special closes or anything like that. Essentially, if there is a problem and your business provides the solution, then you can make this sale. That's as simple as it gets. Do they need to like you? Do you need to build rapport and a relationship along the way? Of course, but that's not really the end goal, right? It just helps the flow of the conversation go more easily if you guys can appreciate each other. If you can make them laugh, if you can enjoy the time there. Obviously, that's good. But the underlying process is all about problem solving. So, what the no sweat intro does and what we focus on when they come in those doors is not a gym tour. It's not test out this workout. It's not a free week trial. It's not, they don't need any of that um, because that doesn't identify a problem or show that you provide the true solution because there's not enough time for them to see like, Oh, CrossFit works. Awesome. Like I lost five pounds in this one workout. Like that's not going to happen. You know, if they enjoy it, cool. But there are so many other workouts that are honestly more fun uh, that don't provide the same, you know, results that we can, but you can't leave it on that one experience, right? So we avoid the workout first and foremost. Uh, we definitely don't do the tour. It's like you're in a CrossFit gym. We could just turn around and be like, Hey, there's a gym. Cool. You saw it. Let's move on. Like, you don't have to do a tour. Don't waste your time. Don't show them how uh, you know your membership software works and that your workout tracking is super cool. They don't care at all. What they care about is if you can solve their problem. So first and foremost, what we try to do is identify that problem. So we'll sit down. We'll start by building a little bit of rapport, just like a simple conversation back and forth. Introduce yourself. Um, ask them a little bit about what led them here in the first place. Uh, what were they hoping that we could do for them? What are some of their goals, right? 
And ultimately, the, the problem comes down to what is holding them back from achieving those goals, right? How, that's where we come in with our solution. So we know that their goal is lose 20 pounds. Okay, awesome. We're going to start asking follow-up questions to try to get to the meat and potatoes of the conversation. But uh, I might follow up to saying like, okay, awesome. That's a great goal to start out with. Why did you pick 20 pounds? Why specifically that number? You know, and then whatever they come back with, maybe they just say like, I don't know, it sounded like a good number. I hear that a lot. Okay, cool. Is the number the thing that's important to you or is it something else that you're looking for out of this? You know, so you can keep following up or trying to peel back the layers essentially and get to the real issue for them, their, their, their why or their hot button, we might call it in sales. And, but we'll dig a little deeper and eventually we might get to with this person like, oh no, it's just about how I feel. It has to do with my confidence. I want to fit into these jeans I've had since high school, right? Uh, gym owners everywhere have heard this plenty of times. So, you know, that's what we're looking for. We're not going to settle with you want to lose 20 pounds? We can help you lose 20 pounds. Let's do it. Cause like Beachbody can do that. Like they, they can do videos at home. They can follow YouTubers. Like they don't have to come to your gym and spend the amount of money they're going to spend in order to lose 20 pounds. They go to your gym and work with you specifically because you can increase their confidence level that you can make them feel better in their own skin. That's our goal. So if you're not trying to do that right now with your intro process, you need to change it. It's what is the true problem that this person's experiencing? And then we can connect the dots. Hey, this is how we're going to help you solve this problem. Maybe even pair that up with some client stories and show them how you've solved this problem in the past for people that they could relate to. Um, so that's, that's really all it is. It's so much more simple than people make it out to be. Like there's no uh, tricks of the trade really with sales. It's just like find the problem, solve the problem you've sold them and that's it. So if you're doing that great, if you're not, change it. Last question for you here, cause that was amazing. And I think you're right. Say it, it, it people, uh, it's as simple as that. Like I think that it's, you're, you're solving a problem. If you can identify the problem, great. If you can't keep asking why until you can, and then offer up a solution if you've got, if you've got the right match, right? If you don't like, it's not gonna work in the long run. So just like, all right, yeah. Sounds like you need the gym down the street then or, or whatever it is, right? But yeah, it's it's identifying the problem and offering a solution, uh, smile, and uh, and you're pretty much there. But my my follow-up question to that is, since you are removed, how do you identify, how do you find talent? How do you identify who would be good as a sales rep for your gym or, you know, maybe you combine the roles where they do CSM stuff and they do sales or they coach and they do sales. So how do you hire, how do you find the talent? How do you hire people? How do you onboard them? And how do you get them trained up? Or is it that you just search for a good personality and then you can train them on sales? How does it work for you when you're trying to, to identify who's going to take this, this role? For this role, it, it definitely starts with the personality and it starts with empathy. So some people are more empathetic than others. Um, and, and it's funny, like if you read that book, Sales EQ, that I recommended at the beginning, um, you'll find you can be too empathetic and you can lack empathy. So like uh, <laughs> on a scale of too empathetic to not empathetic, like the, the not empathetic and just like psychopaths that share no empathy. Uh, so if you watch any uh, docu crime documentaries, you'll, you'll hear that a lot with uh, like serial killers and stuff. They have no empathy. Um, so you do want to have some of it, but uh, salespeople that do really well are somewhere in the middle. If you're too empathetic, you're just going to be like, oh, I get it. You don't have any money. I, I totally understand. That's fine. You know, come back when you're ready, right? And somebody who's maybe more in the middle is going to try and like help solve that problem. Like, what if we did this, right? They'll come back. They'll handle the objection that this person has presented to them. And they might try to find a different solution. Uh, if you have different offerings at your gym, you might drop down to a lower price offering. Uh, you might revert back to, you know, hey, remember, this is why we're here today to rebuild the value in uh, solving that problem for them uh, and then try to reclose it again. So, you know, empathy is important. So I look for somebody who's not like overly empathetic and super sensitive, like they're not gonna do well. They're gonna get eaten alive. Somebody who's in the middle, awesome. Uh, and then obviously personality. Do they have good interpersonal skills? Are they well-spoken? Do they have good body language? Um, you know, are they uh, confident? Confidence is huge in sales. 
So I'm looking for those sort of traits and characteristics. And if I see that, the rest can be done. Because I mean, there's no crazy script to memorize. It's, it's really just like, here are some good conversation starting questions. And then you have to get better at uh, keeping that flow of the conversation by asking good uh, or intelligent follow-up questions and uh, be able to understand and interpret this person's emotions to keep moving or progressing that sale forward uh, by responding to those in the right way. Right. So it's really that that I'm looking for. And then uh, what helps a lot with that, that we do at our gym is role play. So uh, my guys, even with me not there anymore, they continue this for me every Monday. They do a, uh, you know, kickoff for the week, kind of what's going on, what our goals are. Uh, and then they do a sales meeting. So within an hour, they've addressed like, here's where we are for the month performance wise. Here's what our goal is for this week by the end of the week. And then here's what we need to work on. Right. And we'll go around the circle. Um, there's like five uh, or six staff members that are there every week. And we'll talk about experiences uh, that they've had sales opportunities that they've had missed or made. Uh, and then we'll, we'll break those down and maybe role play it. So like, Hey, I missed this sale. Uh, it seemed like it was going really well, but we got to the end and the guy just said, I don't have any money and I, I couldn't go anywhere from there. What would you guys do? And that's where we'll go around and we'll role play that scenario. So that has helped a lot because you get a lot of different ideas from different people and you say like, oh, I like that. I'll try that next time this happens. I mean, price objection happens all the time. So you pretty quickly get a chance to implement, it, right? Uh, so we'll do that. And then we also do a book club where uh, as I mentioned with previous jobs I've had, it's always been a, the case is we read a book and then we discuss that together. So that, you know, we're, we're just breaking all that down within that hour. So I found like find the right people uh, as far as like personality traits and characteristics, look for that empathy scale. They need to be somewhere in the middle, not too empathetic, not lacking of empathy. And then, you know, doing the continued training on a weekly basis as well as role playing goes like a long way to uh, building high performers. Wow. That's amazing. That's, that's a really good point. I never thought about, I never knew you could be too empathetic, but I can definitely see how that uh, could, could hurt you in, in, in the, in terms of the sale. So I'm probably on the other end of the spectrum and that's why I was like always just okay at sales. <laughs> um, but that's awesome. I am the yeah, I'm the too high. It's like, oh, you can't afford it. I'll pay for it then. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll pay for it if you can't. It's fine. Um, yeah, I can see. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely what happened. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Well, Jeff, this has been so much fun. If people want to learn more about sales, if people want to talk to you, if they want to fire themselves, if they want to learn about how to fish, where can they find you? Uh, they can hit me up in my DMs. Uh, they, can, they can email me, jeff at tbrainbusiness.com. Uh, they can also book a free help call. I am, I, I am one of the team for Two Brain that would take that. So there's a chance to get me, if you want me specifically, you can shoot me an email, definitely. Uh, so again, jeff at tbrainbusiness.com or the original Jeff, as I like to uh, think myself, there are four on, on staff, I believe at this point. So yeah, that's right. I just locked down that Jeff only tag. Yeah. You don't have the last name on there. That, that means you were the first. That's how you know. <laughs> okay. Thanks Jeff. Bye. Bye. <laughs>